So hi everyone, thanks for coming up today. So I'll start this talk series with uh, Can Stress Make You Fail, where we're gonna talk about the new exciting feature that uh, I'm currently developing, thanks to the GSOC. So everything started when my uh, Stress GSOC uh, application had has been accepted in March. Um, so after a pretty quick research and discussion phase with the, my mentor, which is Gabby, I started to work on a proof of concept that I'll show you during this presentation. Um, so I'm pretty, I'm, I'm pretty lucky on that uh, side, uh, since you know uh, other people have to, you know, when they want to talk with their mentor, to they have to send emails when they are lucky. They have a chat like ERC or something. And for my my part, uh, since my mentor like physically. Uh, very, uh, it's near me. I just have to walk approximately three meters on talk, so it speed up the designing phase and the discussion phase about how do um, do the project very, very efficiently. So, um, in case you did not see the sun for the past ten years, um, S-Trace is uh, currently a diagnostic tool for Linux that does uh, almost everything you want. So basically, if you take an unknown or a known binary uh, program as a black box, S-Trace logs every syscall made and output more or less detailed information such, such as argument or return value. Uh, you get the idea. Anyway, let's move on more on more interesting stuff. Uh, you'll get plenty of time to contemplate uh, S-Trace logs later on. So. Let's start by a quick observation on the actual state of uh, testing in various projects. We already know that code base sometimes have complex code path because uh, of the size, simply of the size or the design choice. choice. Um, complex code path lead to untested error handlers if they exist. The reason is that complex setup is often required to get into the failing set of condition. So, who does actually write tests for that project, either closed or open source? Yeah, and do you do you even trust in your test? I mean, there is a there is a way to to get things done properly uh, and to test your error handlers, and this is called the fault injection. Fault injection framework actually lets you trigger the conditions when the where the error happens so that you can test it. So, what happens if you inject fault? and no handlers have been made or they, are, or they even contain bad logic in it. It leads to bug or even worse in vulnerabilities and that's rather bad. I mean, this is good for us but, you know, if it's your project, it's kind of bad. So, if we sum up all of this, um, it turns out that overall we get better quality tests. Since, since we can even test complicated cases, we benefit from a strong code coverage, hence it helps reducing potentially flaky part of a program. And what if, what if I told you that you can cancel syscall on a random basis with the random error code? That's pretty much look like fuzzing, right? So let's see how all of this works under the hood in S-Trace. Using ptrace and a little bit of tricks allow us to discard syscall completely. So this is a piece of code that is responsible for, for all the following insanity. So it's, uh, it's a comp code, basically. So it's not like I, I want you to understand the, the huge difference between hiding the syscall and effectively discarding the syscall. Um, so Hiding the syscall uh, is like telling the underneath application that nothing happened even if you actually run the syscall logic. Um, so I think uh, the difference between my GSOC application and the other GSOC applica application was that the other guy wanted to just hide the syscall, but there is a big inherent, in, inherent problem with that is that uh, there is some syscalls that are very dangerous, I mean, in, uh, in the behavior that you cannot uh, just hide. We'll see that later, but if I want to spoil you a little bit, what do you do with reboot? I mean, okay. 
So, and you may think this is too much trickery over there, but I think it's actually the cleanest way to do so. Sorry. So, S-Trace use a big main tracing loop that, in the among of all the other things, pose on two conditions. When we enter a syscall and when we exit a syscall. So, this is very useful to dissect information we want before actually releasing the tracee. When, when we enter a syscall, th the state is checked to see if, it's, if this precise run is concerned by any fault rule. And it's the same for the, all the, the logging information. You, you output information basic, based on what the user wants. I mean, you can select every syscall related to opening file or related to networks, or you can even select a syscall by its number or, or the precise name. All of this con constitute a kind of st um, state machine that we keep in, in this race to do the right things. So, if yes, so if we are concerned by, by this faulting rule, um, with, we set up the faulting state, and this condition is, determ is determined by, uh, with the syscall number and the occurrence number. Because um, you don't want to, to fault every, every syscall out there. We're gonna see that later on, but uh, if you do that, you, you are you will block pretty much every program. Um, and now for, for the exi exiting part of it, um, if we already discarded the syscall, we want to um, you know, change the state to say that we did it. And so that if the, the occurrence was, to, was only once, if we wanted to fail the syscall only once, that's the, since the, the state is cleared, everything gonna happen as you want it. And if you don't do that, the syscall will constantly be rejected and everything will be broke again. So this trick is obviously arc dependent since you have to deal with the architecture way, uh, architecture dependent way of doing and handling syscall. So um, here is the x8664 version of it where we just set the syscall number to minus one uh, with poke user user and the offset of Rx in the user strict. Um, the only change between the arch to discard syscalls is this offset. So it's not a huge change though between the architecture. So let's use it against a little proof of concept to see how everything, wor everything works. So here is a small program that tried to commit suicide, that is kill itself by definition. Can we actually save his life? And yes, we can with S-Trace. So, kind of S-Trace to the rescue. This is a simple filtering rule, rule to forbid, to forbid the, the kill and putting a e-inval, that is invalid argument, in Erno. As you can see, the suicide attempt failed and we were granted by a cute flag. Just a note on this point. Uh, we, that's a design choice to allow every kind of errors. Um, yeah, so you, you are not just limited to return the error that uh, are linked to a syscall. Um, and so when you first, you have to, to pay attention to that in order to not like uh, say you found, you found a bug if the errors wasn't um, uh, linked to the syscall. But anyway, that's kind of useful sometimes if you want to return custom, for example, mmap address or something like that. Um, but that is a really simple case, and I think you see the problem here. And if not, I'll just go back in some slides. So if we rework the definition a bit, S-Trace is now used to monitor and tamper with interaction between process processes on the Linux kernel, which is pretty neat. So how does the filters come into the, into the scene? Previously, I told you there is some problems with uh, canceling syscall this way, and you may already guess it. So if we don't want our target to be able to open the first file it opens, for example, we can discard every open out there. If we don't filter what we cancel, everything is broke. As you can see, the first open is not actually what you think it is. 
the above exa example is a hello world, so I'll not insult you, but there is no explicit open when, while you, you write a hello world. So, but the hell is this? It's, it's part of your uh, operating system machinery to actually load your binary into the main memories and shared libraries and everything. So, as you can see here, everything is discarded um, and there is uh, many fallback attempts to, for example, load the libp thread but we discard it each time, so the binary is not even able to, to launch and to run, yeah. So, actually, um, what, so basically you want to precisely select what this call will fail to, avo to avoid the previous situation. For that, uh, some facility have been added. So this table contains some feature, features that are currently available and that could be used and other that could be used or implemented later. Currently, we can inject fault uh, every nth occurrences, and we can al almost do it randomly. It's still currently in development. Uh, that is on a percentage basis. You say, like, I want to fail this is called 30% of the time. And for that, we have to keep some, somewhere the seed for your, for your PRNG, because when you first, you just you, you don't just want to to first and break thing. You want to re, to be able to reproduce. So you keep the seed somewhere so that you can rerun again and get the same uh, random number used for the for default uh, injection. The two, two more useful options would be able to fault after the nth syscall to avoid every open, but the first three, for example, or less frequently fault before the nth one. And yeah, so can we actually find bug with that proof of concept? Yes, we can. And before I tell you what I found, let me do a little confession. After asking myself uh, which program I should use uh, for, for an example for this, for this talk, um, I did not think of Python at first at, at all. Um, my, my other lazy part, uh, like, I was like, I will find a program that is kind of badly tested or badly implemented so that I'll be able to find, uh, you know, bad patterns and the correct example I want to use. But anyway, I'm even la lazier than that. So I just, you know, launched my Python interpreters and, and I found something kind of cool. So anyway, what happened here? Um, yeah, as you can see, Python uh, throw a seg fault, um, and if we dig a little bit in the in the excuse me the, the in the with the backtrace and um, forgot the word anyway, um, yeah, as you can see after the dev you random no raise everything fall apart. So does the pi fat error function throw a seg fault? And intuitively I'd say no, but we can verify that. After uh, a quick verification check, PyFat error do not throw a seg fault, but, but I see get both. So it, it would be a shame, though. So it kind of seems like something went wrong in the, in the middle of PyFat error's execution. And if we dig a, a little bit further, um, we see that in the backtrace we find Py error fetch that call an obscure PyThread state get. And turns out that this Python state get thing returned null at some point. This answering multiple null references, as you can see here and there, or here also, yeah, so you get it. So we already got a patch after just a couple of minutes of testing. So I was so ready to send a patch on everything. I started to, to read how to contribute, what are the good things to do and to avoid on their mailing list and so on. But after the, the Mercurial synchronization, I saw that it seems corrected by a side effect of another change concerning the, the giant lock. As you can see here, we get a SIGA board as expected, so everything seems fine, but that's just a side effect, so I don't know. I don't know but uh, how do you feel about that, but anyway. Um, they also discovered the get, you, get random from Linux 3.17 and no, and reading the raw dev view random is no fallback. Yeah. So, 
you can be you will be able to try this at so at home sooner or later as soon as the code will be upstream um, I invite you to do so because it's fun you may uh, it may even worth some dollar if the project uh, you are targeting have bugs bounty or something like that and you'll contribute to the overall software robustness so if I were if I were you, I'd wait for the fuzzy logic to be fully implemented, though, because it will be a little bit it will be a lot easier to find bug uh, if you don't, if you don't know what to search. The other way, uh, if you don't use the fuzzy logic, you may want to search for common flaky pattern, often used uh, like this one. I call it blind trust because. Uh, the following program open a binary file and draw a normalized histogram. So basically, it's you know counting the byte occurrence and div dividing everything by the uh, total number of bytes of the file. So nothing seems seems to be very wrong here. Expect one thing: the following piece of code rely on the fact that if open worked, then fstat will. That's not always true, and we'll demonstrate this easily after our fault injection on f-state. So here, if we cancel f-state, regardless of the error code return, because no code check uh, the return value, we get a floating point exception, which is uh, normal. If you remember, we divided each byte occurrence number by the total number of the byte, which is the size we got uh, via f-state. And since fs was in the BSS, it's kindly initial initialized to zero. Hence, the dividing by zero on the floating point exception. Um, this kind of pattern are more from you that you may think. That's why I think it's worth, worth mentioning it. Um, yeah, S trace is basically parsing tricks and parsing. So inherent, inherently, you have to test your parser because it's more or less the only thing you can test. But as usual, how do you ensure a good code coverage without good tests? How do you even test reboot? And we're gonna see that. Dis despite the funny prototype and the wizard errors about bad logic, reboot is a syscall. And as a syscall, it should be tested without any discrimination. And how, how do you do that? Do you, issue, do you issue a reboot and pray for your logger to, to have the chance to log before being killed? I think that's the wrong approach. And it's straightforward with fault injection. Simply discard it and adapt your test case to ignore the discarded return value. That's pretty much simpler and cleaner. On another, on another flavors, IOC tails are sometimes hard to test because like dangerous syscall, they have sometimes unwanted consequences. We are far from the right on yesterday out that we can ignore. If you use minus one as a file descriptor, um, what, it's what we, we do actually, but things get pretty much broke. Um, so we, we, we have a better choice on that. It's to use uh, real and compatible file descriptors. So again, for this fault injection can be used here to facilitate the analysis and the debug phase. Since I'm almost at 20 minutes, I'll conclude on that. Um, this is a fun and promising option since there, it, there is a lot of untested code out there in the wild. However, more code is needed to be uh, really usable. I'm thinking about the fuzzy logic. Um, it still needs other tests on different architecture as well and more or less, and more code review, uh, of course, because it's not yet uh, upstream. So I'll let you take some uh, contact information. Do not hesitate to take them in case you have questions later. And if you have any questions right now, I'll be glad to answer them. Thanks.